So um, it is 11 o'clock. Um, we have uh, 43 people participating in this meeting. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Mike Pallett. I'm the uh, chairman of the San Diego Regional Urban Forest Council. I'm also, my day job is I'm vice president at uh, West Coast Arborists. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all to our um, meeting. We, we do these meetings every other month. So this is our April meeting. So our next meeting will be April, May, June. So it'll be June, June 2nd, actually, will be our next meeting. And we're still working out the details on the topic for that meeting. But um, the Regional Urban Forest Council is one of seven councils statewide. Uh, we are an affiliate of the California Urban Forest Council. And basically, we do regional support for a variety of uh, educational topics. You know, when, if needed, we can help support a, a given agency's challenges. And, and really, the essence is, is to try and help support each other in, in the vari various things involved in managing an urban forest. So that's the, uh, the little 101 on, on us. We have an executive committee meet, uh, executive committee that meets uh, monthly and we can work on a variety of uh, activities. Um, so we, we, um, we, we have money that we get to spend every year from the US Forest Service. We get about $2,000 a year that we put together a variety of uh, unique things we use on that money. But um, with that said, here's the agenda for today's meeting. Uh, we got two awesome speakers, Don Odell and Mark Hoddle. And if, for those of you that thought they were the same person, here's proof that they're not. <laughs> So uh, we got Don coming from uh, LA. You're presenting from LA today, Don? Does that sound right? Yes. Yes, and then Mark's actually presenting from New Zealand, from Auckland, New Zealand. So we're all over the globe here today, which is pretty awesome. So, but here's the agenda, 11 to 12.30ish, uh, we'll will be presenting this, these, this topic on this pest update. Um, we're gonna take actually a half hour lunch break. Uh, we'll regroup at one o'clock. Hopefully you all stick around for our, our after lunch business meeting. Uh, covering a variety of things, just, just regional stuff happening that we like to talk about. So uh, with that, I'm actually going to hand this over to Megan Shaw. She's going to be the moderator for our, uh, our panelists today. And again, thank you, Mark and Don, for, for being here and for proving that you are indeed two individuals. So with that, I'll hand, I'll hand it off to Megan. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we wanted to have this topic today to give a little bit of an update on some regional pest issues, one of our favorite topics around here. Um, so we're going to talk about a new and emerging pest that we're seeing issues with, the erythrina loss. Um, and Don will be giving us a, a nice presentation about that. We'll have a short Q&A, uh, about 15 minutes, with a small panel following his presentation. So please put your questions uh, during the presentation in the chat box, and I'll uh, make sure that we get those asked at the end of the presentation. Um, and then following that, we'll have uh, Mark um, present on the South American palm weevil. There's been some new uh, information that's come out and some new host species that will be uh, discussing. So that's going to be quite interesting. Again, please put your questions in the chat box and we'll have a small Q&A with a, a panel following the discussion. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Don and we'll talk about the Aerith Rhino Moth. Okay. Can you see my screen? Is my, is my screen visible? No, not yet. Hmm. All right, so what happened? We had it up here before. We did. There's a, there's a share screen on the bottom there. It should be on the bottom of your thing there, Don. Well, no, all, all I, I don't even have the, this is almost weird, okay. Oh, why did we Let's see? I have no idea what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on a different screen? Did you minimize in some capacity? No, I, I've, I've lost the Zoom. I've lost the Zoom. Uh, it's probably in your toolbar down below. Look for like a little camera thingy. Yeah, you know what? No, it's, this is just. 
I think what I'm going to do. Sign off and sign back on. No. So there's nothing here. Get out and go back. I'm going to get out and, 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 and go and go back in. We, so. we might be able to switch the order, Megan, maybe Mark, if you're prepared, maybe we could have Mark go first and let Don sort it out. Let's kind of oh, switch our order. <laughs> yeah, sure. That could work. Mark, are you uh, available to jump in first? Uh, yes. Yeah, I can do that. Well, I can, I can, I can start. It's just uh, here. Yeah. So. Okay, so let me try sharing my screen again, okay? Okay, go for it. Oh, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute, okay. I'm gonna share. See, now I can't find the uh, work. All right, just a minute. Hey Don, if you minimize everything on your screen, you might see your Zoom stuff hiding behind yeah. the um, yeah, um, me... screens that you currently have open. Yeah, let me see. That's what happened to me. It looked like it had disappeared, but it was hiding in the background behind my PowerPoint. There you go. Oh, oh, oh. it's working. Wait, All right. Something, something's happening here. Okay, it looks like we got you up there. Wanna open up your presentation. All right. We, well, hello everybody, and welcome to the um, San it's Diego. Not your, it's not your presentation yet, so I think you got to. It, it's not. It says, photo, it says Photoshop. It says, "Welcome to Photoshop, Donald." So you, we're looking at a different screen. If you can oh. move it over. <laughs> I see. I don't see. <laughs> I don't see that anywhere. That's very strange. It's definitely sharing your screen, but we're not sure which screen it's sharing. Yeah, beautiful photos, Don. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no idea what's going on. Let me see this. This is Photoshop. You might want to close it down. Yeah, just, just a minute. Okay, now let me see. <laughs> this is crazy technology okay so what do you see now um just the, the yet. Um, participants meeting participants okay so we want to share the screen okay share now what do you see <laughs> yes we're there Got it. you've done it Six. success okay all right let me start over we had this all set up before we actually started the meeting. And then, and then, and then Mike put his thing up there and then all of a sudden I couldn't find mine. But anyway, we're, we're back here and we're ready to go, finally. So uh, my name is Don Hodell. I'm Emeritus Landscape Horticulture Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension in Los Angeles. And the important word here is emeritus. I retired after 36 years, nearly two years ago. And now I have no time whatsoever at all. I'm busier than ever. And I don't know how that happened. In fact, when my late father retired in 1980, he said, Don, I've never been so busy in all my life. I don't know how I got anything done while I was working. And I didn't believe him, but now I, I do believe him. It's unbelievable. Okay, so before we get too far in, a couple things I wanted to share with you. If you're interested in palms, and of course Mark's going to be talking about the biggest threat to palms in, in the San Diego area after me, uh, you might want this book. I, I wrote it about seven or eight years ago. Western Chapter ISA uh, published it, and it covers all you want to know about palm management, including biology of palms and a, a compendium of species that we grow here in Southern California. And I'm not tooting my own horn here. I don't, I don't make one thin dime off this book. In fact, all the proceeds go back into the research fund 
at the uh, Britain Fund in the ISA Western chapter. Another thing I want to bring your attention to is some free stuff. I have a web website in the University of California, and, and the, the most important part of it to me is the e-journal that I am editor of. It's called Palm Arbor, and we're, we are in our sixth year now, and uh, last year was very productive because of COVID. I didn't go any place. I just primarily stayed home, and so I did a lot of writing, and we got over 20 articles published last year in Palm Arbor, and it's very easy to find. Just Google Hodel Palms Trees, and it'll take you to Palm Arbor. In fact, uh, there's an article in there on the Erythrina stem borer, which I'll be talking about. And there's also an article on uh, the South American palm weevil. And there's articles on two more emerging threats to palms in Southern California. On the left, you see a king palm. This is in Orange, up in Orange County. And we have a big problem with banana moth now on, on king palms, kentias and majesties and windmill palms. In fact, up in Orange and LA counties, banana moth is the preeminent threat right now to palms. It, it's just as severe as palm weevil is to Canary Island date palms in the San Diego area. And then, and then there's been the emergence of, of a new fusarium wilt disease. And it's called fusarium wilt of queen and Mexican fan palms. And on the lower right, you see a queen palm in Fallbrook in North County that has this new fusarium wilt. And on the left, you see Mexican fans in Playa Vista near Marina del Rey in Los Angeles County that are going down from this new wilt disease. So uh, we're probably all familiar with fusarium wilt of Canary on the date palm, but uh, we are unfamiliar with a new type of fusarium wilt that's attacking two of our most common palms. And I have articles on all this in Palm Arbor. So uh, if you need information, you can take a look at, at those. All right, the erythrina stem borer. Well, uh, for, for me in my career, erythrinas are, are one of my favorite tree group of trees. They have incredible spring uh, color typically without any leaves, so they're really showy, as on this Erythrina caffra. And uh, if they aren't watered too much, uh, they, they, they're, they're, they're great landscape plants. Once established, at least in coastal areas, they don't need a lot of water. You often see them planted in a lawn or a, a well-irrigated landscape. And in that case, they put on a lot of rank green growth with not too many flowers, and you often see branches falling out of them. And they really don't like lawn irrigation. They, they Once established, uh, they just need a, a very infrequent deep irrigation to get the best growth and best floral display from them. Now here's uh, Erythrina lysistemon, another great uh, species for us. Coralloides, many of you might know, it has that, that uh, unusually Usual colored bark. And here's a nice Erythrina falcata, a very atypical one, by the way. Typically, falcata is a large, tall species. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a low spreading one, and it's right there in Balboa Park, right in your backyard. So, uh, Erythrina is about 110 species in the leguminosae family or bean family, formerly. Now it's in the uh, new family name, Fabaceae. And as I said, they're useful, valuable, well-adapted, often spectacular uh, flowering trees. And they're now under threat from this moth called the Erythrina stem borer. And it's called the stem borer because the uh, moths Females lay eggs on the on the new shoot tips. The eggs hatch, hatch and the larvae burrow into the shoot tip and basically uh, kill it. So not only does this affect flowering, but it terminates the growth of that shoot 
And you can see it on the picture on the right that a couple of the laterals are now branching out at, at leaf axles below the dead tip. And then these themselves will be attacked later. So uh, it, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts here. You, you, you don't need to prune this tree anymore. It's self pruning because of the uh, stem borer. But at the same time, uh, it's going to stop flowering in many cases, and in some cases, it'll even kill the tree. So it's sometimes called the uh, erythrina twig borer, but the most common name is the stem borer. And the, the, the moth is Terastia meticulosalis. Sorry for that tongue twister. And it was first detected in North County, San Diego. I think I think at a either a nursery or landscape in near Fallbrook. And it's thought to have been introduced on nursery stock from Florida, but it's now found from San Diego uh, up to at least Ventura. So this was about five years ago. So it's probably spread even farther than that. Probably every place, everywhere where where erythrina grows in Southern California we could have the stem borer. Uh, it, in, in South Florida, it has made the growing of all exotic erythrina impossible. It's, you cannot grow exotic erythrina in South Florida. The only erythrina they can grow there now is the native one, erythrina herbacea, which evolved with this moth and thus likely has some inherent defense mechanisms. Uh, here in California, it's been detected on uh, Erythrina bidwillii, Erythrina chiapasana, a very rare species, Erythrina corolloides, Erythrina cristigali, and Erythrina falcata. But I'm, I'm sure that it's likely on other species too. In fact, it often goes undetected. Someone sees a few uh, dead tips and they think, oh, something else happened. Maybe it was cold or something like that when, it, when it's probably the erythrina stem borer. In Florida, at least, it's often found with another serious pest, the erythrina leaf roller. But fortunately, uh, that pest has not yet been found here. So it's just the stem borer that's been detected so far. So here's a, a moth and these uh, photos are courtesy of a University of Florida professor, Surikov. And the moth is probably about an uh, inch and a half to two inches uh, across. And you, you see it in various poses here. What's uh, interesting about it is the abdomen. And, and you on the photo in the upper right, you see the abdomen with these knobby appendages on it. And then the lower right, you see the abdomen in a raised position. So this uh, moth, the erythrina stem borer, is one of five species of this genus. They're all tropical, and they occur from the Americas to Africa, Asia, and the Western Pacific. In the US, uh, it, it occurs from Florida and South Carolina, now to California. And it's the only species of the genus Terastia that occurs in the Americas. So Terastia is basically a, an old world genus. We only have one species here in the US. And as I said, the adults have about a one to two inch wingspan. The eggs are laid in leaf axles. The young larvae are about a fifth of an inch long and they burrow directly into flowers or the stem or even the seed pod. The mature larva is about 1.5 inches long. So here you see uh, some more photos of, on the, on the left, you see an egg that's been laid in the leaf axle of a, a newly expanding shoot and that, that egg will hatch and the larva will burrow right into the stem. So in the upper right, you see a stem that I've torn open and there's the larva of the erythrina stem borer. In the lower right, you see a pupa of the stem borer.
uh, the, the, the spring generate, at least in, in what we know about this pest in Florida has a, has kind of a spring and, and then a summer and fall generation. The spring generation are typically larger because they're feeding mostly on the more nutritious seeds from the previous season's blooms. The summer and fall generations feed mostly inside stems and are smaller because the, the, the stems aren't as nutritionally rich. Full grown larvae descend uh, from the tree on a long silk thread to the ground and so they, they pupate in the leaf litter. They're strong flyers and their endophagus uh, feeding habit, mean, meaning inside the plant, offers protection from predators parasites and abiotic threats. So this is one of the reasons why this pest is difficult to control. It, it's, it's very mobile and because it's actually inside the plant, not on the outside of it, it's difficult to uh, for parasites and predators to gain access to it. Like I said, it's, it's sort of like uh, death by a thousand cuts. So here you see some examples of some shoot tips that have died from the from the larval boring of the erythrina stem borer. So if you see this on your erythrina, it, undoubtedly uh, it, it has the erythrina stem borer. And you, you notice the frass on the photos on the on the right. So that's a byproduct of the pest. Uh, once inside the uh, stem, uh, the, the larvae crawl backwards to the entry hole to defecate because they want to clear their chamber of frass. And so there you see a, a pile of frass at the, at the uh, entry hole. Now, I've split open the stem so you can see it better. In the, in the upper left, you see a seed pod that has entry exit holes. And lower left, you see a, a larva inside a seed pod. And, and notice it's taken on kind of a pinkish brown color because when they eat the erythrina seeds, which are basically red, they actually, it actually, they actually absorb some of the color of the seeds and they change the color of the, of the larva. Uh, you know, little, little is known about the management and what we have to base it on is what's happened in Florida. And uh, nearly all attempts at post infestation eradication in Florida have failed. And they've, they've tried, um, you know, pesticides and, and even the systemic materials, they, they, they just don't seem, seem to work. Uh, little's known about natural enemies but they must be present in the natural range of this pest. And uh, maybe that, that might be the, the best route that uh, we can take. Uh, however, you know, because this is a tropical pest and it's been really bad in Florida, they've been unable to grow or cultivate exotic erythritis there. It, it may turn out not to be as bad here in Southern California because we aren't a tropical location. We have cooler temperatures and this may help to slow down the life cycle and keep populations of this pest reduced. So while we may always have it here and it may always be damaging to some of our tree, erythrina trees, it, may not stop cultivation of erythritis entirely here, simply because we're not in a favorable climate for the pest, or at least as favorable, favorable as it could be. In some instances, uh, intense management might be justified for rare, exceptional, or noteworthy and valuable specimens. Uh, again, we haven't really trialed this out. Uh, I, I have a tree planting program in Southeast LA and counties and adjacent parts of Orange County. 
and I planted uh, the Hawaiian erythrina in one of the parks. That's erythrina sandwichensis. And it immediately got the stem borer. And I, I put uh, imidacloprid on it. And uh, I, I was able to kind of keep it at bay for a couple seasons, but then I got tired of, of repeated applications of pesticides, so I quit doing it. And uh, I still get dead tips on it. It's not large enough to flower yet, but I, I think it may uh, continue to grow. It might not have as many flowers as it would because it's gonna have a lot more dead tips, but uh, I think, I think it'll still, we'll still be able to grow it here. But some of the things we, we probably can do include intense, vigilant scouting for this pest and immediate removal bagging and disposal of infested tips. Also, because as I mentioned earlier, the stem borer pupates in the leaf litter underneath the tree, thoroughly rake, bag, and dispose of fallen leaves underneath the tree and perhaps uh, intense ground and foliar treatments with systemic pesticides might help to, might help to control this pest. But again, the, uh, the latter uh, strategy, pesticides might, you know, it's, um, you gotta really weigh whether constant repeated applications are really gonna be, be beneficial and, and are worth the investment not only in, in terms of money and time, but in, but in damage to the environment. So I would um, probably not encourage that type of strategy, but uh, I, I think scouting and then cleaning up leaf litter might, might be just as effective in keeping populations low. Uh, in addition to the root zone applications, Cover barrier insecticides like pyrethroids or BT on the foliage might also work. But again, there's been very little, virtually no investigation of this here in California. And always remember that, that these pesticide strategies have not proven too effective in Florida. But, but again, the, the bet, the advantage that we might have is that we're not as tropical as South Florida. And so we may have our cooler environment working for us in this case. And, and perhaps, perhaps a, a pesticide strategy might be a little bit more effective here than in Florida. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Are there we can take questions now, I guess. Is that the way it's going to be, Megan? Yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, pull in Christy Powell, who uh, works over at the zoo in their horticulture department, and Eric Cast, who is our park arborist, um, to join in on the Q&A panel here. We do have a few questions here in the box. And uh, just go ahead and, you know, Decide, you know, you guys can all chime in or decide who would like to take a question. Um, so the first question we have here uh, is any impacts on the native erythrina? Impact on what kind of erythrina? It just says a native erythrina. I'm not sure exactly. Well, in, which... in California, we don't have a native erythrina. So um, uh, there is one in northern Mexico. They could be tuning in from possibly another area. Yeah, um, yeah the okay. La Bella Formis is um, yeah, Arizona. Is, yeah. And, and then the Sandwichensis in, in Hawaii, um, in Herbacea in Florida. But we haven't seen it too bad on La Bella Formis at the zoo. Um, I'll say that at the zoo, we first noticed it in 2015. Um, the tip borer, and we had a pretty bad year that year as far as um, infestations. But um, since then, it seems like it hasn't gotten any worse, which is good. Um, in our nursery, we were able to exclude a lot of the pests by putting um, a shade cloth around with a zipper for all of our outdoor grown nursery stock. 
um, because some of the nursery stock would just get riddled and it would kill an entire um, small seedling because the, the pests would just go, the just bore straight down into the roots and kill the whole seedling. So we've been able to um, exclude it from our nursery. And so they're able to get a larger size before planted out. So that's been, been helping. Um, we've actually witnessed um, birds also pulling the the um, worms out of uh, the tips of some of the individual large trees that we have on ground, which, which was um, pretty interesting. And pruning practices, um, we've stopped pruning in the summer. So that seemed to help um, as well because when we've pruned in the summer previously and then the um, tree starts growing and then that new growth, the um, tip borer seems to love that new growth. So that seems to help as well. And we do rake, rake up the leaves um, underneath the individual trees that are, are rarely fested. And Don, just like you mentioned, mostly we've seen it on is the um, bidwillii, um, the falcata, and um, the cristigale. Those are the ones we've seen. You, uh, Christy, nice to see you, by the way. Yes, you too. You bring up an, an interesting point that, that and this is, I think this is common to a lot of initial exotic invasions, that they seem to spike the first couple of years or so, and, and, then, and then they kind of decline somewhat and then plateau out. And I think that's typical of a lot of uh, new invasions of exotic uh, pests. And, and that may be what's going on too with the, with the stem borer and uh, wh why, why they, they spike initially and then kind of taper off but never really go away completely. It could be that other predators get on them and, and they're helping to control the populations or some other factor is in play. But uh, yeah, yeah. And we, we first noticed it in LA County in 2015, probably not too long after it was detected in San Diego. And uh, we, we still see it, we still see it up here, but it's not, it, it um, I, I think it's kind of done the same thing up here. It's kind of reduced a little bit, not gone away, but kind of plateaued out and, uh, I don't know why, but I'm happy. I mean, it's it's kind of sort of a relief, but but we still have it. Excellent. And I, I see right. a question about the pheromone. I can answer that. I know we were working yes, with John, John Kabashimo on trying to get a um, detect the pheromones. We were going to send him larvae, but we were able, unable to collect enough <laughs> for them to do the study um, to get a pheromone that would attract the the moth. I'm not sure if he's worked on that anymore or be able to get any more um, samples in order to look for a pheromone. But that's um, the last I heard. I know that the moths are very much attracted to light. So early in the morning when we'd be coming into work, we would see them hovering all around the lighted offices. All right, we got a couple other questions here. Let's see. Uh, is bagging of the leaf litter enough to kill the pupae? What else should be done, if anything, to ensure this pest doesn't spread to other trees? Uh, I, I didn't quite hear that completely. Was, was, is, is the question, is bagging of the leaf litter sufficient by itself? Yes. Uh, pr probably, probably not. Other, thing, other things can be employed too. Like Christy mentioned, timing of the pruning is probably critical. And um, re re removing infested shoot tips as quickly as possible. I, I, think, I think you have to employ all these techniques, not, not just one. And I would just mention about removing re, um, the shoot tips. We started to do that at the beginning, but then it seemed to be by the time we would remove it, the pest would already be gone and had left. And then it would cause more growth to happen at the tips and then the it would have um, affected again. So we've now stopped removing the shoot tips unless um, it's a nursery stock where we can see it and see that it's still in there yet. Yeah, you, you know, when you remove a shoot tip, you're basically pruning the plant, which, which does encourage lateral, lateral buds uh, to, to sprout and grow. Okay, is a larval feeding restricted primarily to green stems or can the larvae burrow into the woody branches too? 
Well, my, my experience has been they need fresh, young, succulent, green growth. Um, that, that's my experience. And that, that's Christy seen something different. All right. <clears throat> Uh, is this impacted by temperature, such as coastal viruses, inland areas? Are you finding that reducing uh, dedicated irrigation may slow down growth, reduce baby leaf um, annual quantity, and maybe reduce and taper off the insect population? That, that's a long question. <laughs> um, I got the first part of it. You know, I, I've seen this pest attack things right near the coast and, and as far inland as 25 miles. So um, again, I think, I think generally because we have cooler temperatures than South Florida, that probably is helping. But I think in, in terms of just Southern California, I don't think there's gonna be any difference between coastal versus versus inland, I, th I think there's still always gonna be a problem. And as I mentioned, when I began this talk, I think a lot of erythrinas are, are the, the ir their irrigation strategy in the landscape is, is less than optimal. I think they're generally given too much and too frequent water. And this encourages a lot of fresh young growth. So I think for, for maximum floral display, and, and to, to keep rank growth checked, I think irrigation management is really critical. And, and again, I, I think it's uh, lengthening the time bef between irrigations and then doing deeper ir irrigations when you, do when you do irrigate. And I think this will help to keep this succulent rank growth to a, a minimum. Great. Um, I have a question about the, if you are going to use a pesticide, is there a primary time to be applying it? So maybe pot potentially after flowering before the new shoot uh, growth comes, when, when would we recommend trying to treat? Well, I, I've only treated one plant, <laughs> but based on, 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 on the, on the temp temperatures and growth of erythrinas in Southern California, as the weather warms up, they tend to grow more. So I would want to make sure that I'd have something on the plant to protect the new growth as it emerges. So you would probably want to have some, if, you're, if it's a systemic, you'd probably want to have it in the soil by February or March. And um, you may want to, I, I, depending on its uh, rate of application, you, you might want to think if it's if the label says it's okay. You might want to think about a, a a fall application to try to get some up into the tree during over the winter, so that the new spring growth the next year would, would be protected. But but again, I I'm not sold on 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 these on these pesticide on the systemic pesticide treatments because uh, I you, you got to think consider the load you put in the environment of the pesticide and then whether it's really gonna, gonna work. And, and in Florida, it hasn't worked that well. So we need to do more work on it, I guess. We have a, we have a follow-up question um, on what were the failed treatments uh, practices that failed in Florida? Uh, it sounds like almost everything they've tried. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't know of, I don't know of specific treatments they tried. I was talking to Floridian arborists and they told me, and they weren't specific about what they tried. I can mention for what and we tried we'll, at the zoo, if that helps. Yeah, um, go ahead. We did try a metacoprid um, for some of our erythrinas, especially the erythrina bidwillii. And it took so long for it to get up into the tips of the um, we did our study and did leaf uh, tissue analysis of how much imidacloprid was in the plant, moving it, it up the plant. And it took a good, you know, because we we're using a merit, um, like two months or so before it got up into the, the tips of the, of the tree um, to provide any protection. But we did have some luck with some of our nursery stock. We did a, a imidacloprid 
Onyx and Cease application because we're also dealing with the invasive shot hole borer on erythrina. Um, and that did seem to help slightly, but only, you know, anecdotally right now. Thank you, Chrissy. That's very good information. Um, and then we have a question here, Don. Uh, can you repeat the pesticide you use when you tried to treat in LA? Oh, it was it was imidacloprid. And, and it was on erythrina sandwich census. <laughs> A, a, a kind of an uncommon species in Southern California. Um, one last question is, what is the life cycle? And then it says, sorry if I missed it. What is the life cycle? Mm -hmm. You mean you mean how many days from from like egg to adult? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, go with that. I don't. I don't. I don't know that. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. And, the and rest they do in... send, tend to come up um, like this time of year, they, the new flush of growth looks so great. And then you're like, oh, it looks so good. No erythrina stem borer yet. But then it seems like all of a sudden, you know, as it gets warmer, then they start hitting and you see the damage um, by summertime. Yeah, if, the, if that's what the question, intent of the question was, uh, that's been my uh, experience is that, it's, that you see all this nice new growth in the spring and it's undamaged for a while. And then not too long after that, you see all these uh, flagging dead tips. So yeah, spring so, and early so summer. We think, yeah, so we think they're really more active when it starts to warm. Yeah, they're, they're attracted to new growth. Sure, it's softer and more succulent easier to penetrate. Excellent. Um, all right, the rest of the questions here are more comments. We have one that says it was found in Huntington Beach. And then Mark suggests possibly a, a leaf vacuum with a rotary shredder could mulch the leaf litter as it gets blown into the bag. So we could uh, shred the larvae and pupae. All right. Hey, anyone else want to share any information or have any other questions? Uh, we have about two more minutes for Q&A, and then we'll switch over to talk about the South American palm weevil. Good job, Don. You're the man. Oh, you're, you're welcome. I enjoyed doing it for you folks. A lot of great information, things that... I definitely did not know and aren't super easy to find when you research the pest. So thank you so much, Don, for sharing. Okay, you're welcome. All right, well, if there's no more questions, let's go ahead and uh, get Mark to share his screen so we can start the presentation on South American palm weevil. Very good, thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Don. You're welcome. All right, how's that looking? You can see it, it's a little blurry at the moment. I'm not sure why that is. Okay. That, that was good. It's coming into focus now, you think? Yes. All right. Okay, um, well, I'll get going. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak this morning. Um, I'm going to be providing you some updates on the uh, South American palm weevil invasion into Southern California. And Megan asked me to touch on some of the new palm hosts that have been recorded, um, basically been killed by this weevil. So as the populations have grown and spread, especially into the Balboa Park area, this weevil is now developing new host plant associations and a lot of these palm species it has no evolutionary association with. So these are truly novel associations. So we'll be talking a bit about that this morning as well. So this is what I'd like to cover with you. We'll go over some weevil damage um, to palms, a bit of uh, biology on the weevil. So you have a good idea of what you're looking for in the landscape. And then if you actually do find something, you'll have a reasonably good idea of what's going on. 
based on the biology of the insect that you're looking at. I will go over some of the new palm hosts that have been identified at Balboa Park. Um, I'll provide some updates on the Sweetwater Reserve infestation in Bonita down San Diego County. I'll just briefly touch on the trapping that's still going on in the palm surveys that we're doing around the reserve to check mortality rates in the urban area. A little bit on management, briefly touch on insecticide applications. We are now well into a second year of um, trials now with um, a, a commercial company and the data are starting to roll in but they're still premature. There's a lot of variation in the data and I'm a little reluctant to share some of it, especially some of the compounds that we are testing until we finish that trial and the statistical analyses have been done. I'll go into some of the trapping that we've been doing with the Pacusin and the bucket trap. So if you want to go out and do some monitoring, you'll have a better idea of which traps you should be using and how best to uh, use them. And then um, I'll just finish up with um, a link to a web page where if you see palms that have been killed by the South American palm weevil, you can go to this website, upload the uh, site information, some photos, and that way we can plot them into Google Earth to try and get a better idea of what's happening with the spread of the weevil through San Diego County. Right now, there are no um, official survey programs running for this pest. So we're relying on community scientists to help us figure out where this weevil is and how quickly it's spreading. So this whole story started in 2010 down in Tijuana when I got a call to go down and look at some Canary Island date palms that were dying down there. And we went up into the dead crowns here and we found this rather large weevil, the South American palm weevil. And it's now well established in San Diego County and it's uh, California's largest weevil species now. So the life cycle is pretty simple. These are long snouted weevils. Uh, you're actually looking at a male here and I'll get into how you identify males and females, but both sexes have these long snouts or rostrums and they use that nose to drill a hole into the top of the palm. And then the female turns around into that hole and she'll deposit these eggs, which are actually quite large. And then those eggs hatch and it's the grubs or these weevil larvae that cause the damage to the palm tree that ultimately result in its death. So it's the larval feeding to the apical meristem of the palm tree that ultimately kills the palm. And because that growing area is killed, it can't develop new fronds and palms only grow from the top. So you never see much sprouting. You know, it's, with certain palms, you might see suckers coming off the bottom. But once the top of the palm has been killed, especially with some of these big canaries, it's a death sentence for those trees. They're not going to recover. You will see the uh, pupil cocoons here. They're spun out of fibers that the weevil larvae gather up from the palm host. These chambers are created at the bottom of the palm, palm fronds. The weevil larvae push into the base of the frond create a tunnel, then they sit in there, and then they pull in these palm fibers around themselves while they're sitting in that little tunnel that they've made. And they basically spin around, wrapping themselves very tightly in these palm fibers. Here I've cracked open one of the palm uh, pupil cocoons, and you can see here the pre-pupil larva. It has not yet developed its wing buds and it has not entered the pupil stage. So it's basically just finished wrapping up its cocoon. It's now resting. It'll shed its skin one more time. And then with that molt, it'll develop these wing buds here. And then within that cocoon, it will then molt one more time and then the adult weevil will, will emerge. So these weevils have these mandibles on the end of the snout. They use those mandibles or teeth to not only drill holes into the palm tree to lay their eggs, but they also use it to snip out a little exit hole at the end of the pupil cocoon so they can get out. So if you catch weevils, either in traps or you find them walking around on the sidewalk near a palm tree or they've fallen into your swimming pool, you can uh, sex them by looking at the nose. Males have these bristles or seti, quite a stout row of them that sit on the top of the rostrum here. Females lack that rostral beard. So the nose of a female is smooth, but the males have these whiskers sitting on the top of the nose. So very easy to identify. You don't need any magnifying equipment to see that bump on the nose. So they're, they're pretty easy to see. This, these photos show some of the damage you're likely to see on these Canary Island palm fronds. This is the basal sheath that sits at the bottom of the frond. It's been basically turned into Swiss cheese by the larvae if they, as they burrow their way out of the apical meristem and into the base of the frond. Here you can see the base of the frond where they've made those tunnels within which they will pupate. 
When feeding damage is really severe, the top of the crown will fall out, and at this stage, the palm tree will die. There's no recovery possible at this stage. And here in the background, you can see some healthy palm trees that have not had their crowns attacked. If you go down into the damaged area, you'll find the larvae feeding. They turn that apical meristem area into a rancid mash, and it has a very distinctive odor. It's very warm and it's fermenting. You can scoop it out, it's very wet. Some instances, the cavity that the weevils basically excavate in the top part of the palm trunk, which is still quite woody, can be filled with water. And these larvae are like swimming around in their feeding. So they have a high tolerance for being, um, for living in very humid, extremely damp environments. And it's probably this thickness of the palm trunk too that insulates them from excessive heat in California and probably from our, ex from our cold winters as well. So these weevil larvae will not drill their way right down to the bottom of the tree trunk. Most of the activity is contained within maybe the first couple of feet of the trunk, top part of the tree trunk in the woody material, but even going that deep is rarely seen. So one other issue that we may face in the future with uh, South American palm weevil is that it's the only species of palm weevil that is known to vector a palm killing nematode and this nematode is referred to as the red ring nematode because infected farms that have the nematode develop the circular red ring do not know why it's red i do not know why it is perfectly circular i've not been able to find a good explanation for both the color and the pattern of this of this infection but the adult weevils can carry these nematodes either attached to the outsides of their bodies or they can even live inside the body. So when the weevils defecate or they regurgitate saliva to feed or they lay eggs, they'll deposit these nematodes into the palm tree. So some information that's come out of Central America where this is a big problem, especially in coconut palm plantations, suggests that mortality rates of palms when these nematodes get into them may range from about 35 to 80%. So even if you were able to successfully treat one of your palm trees with an insecticide and kill off all the weevils, if the weevils have introduced that nematode into the palm, it is still likely to die. Thankfully for California, the nematode has not yet been recorded from this state. However, like a lot of the insect disease combinations that we see in the state, we often get the vector first, and then it's several years later, the disease causing organism shows up. And a good example of this has been the Asian citrus psyllid invasion into Southern California. We got the psyllid, it was around for about four or five years or so. And then the disease that it's, um, then the bacteria that causes the disease Huang Long Bing well, was picked up. And we may see something similar here with red ring nematode. We get the weevil first, several years later, the disease causing organism shows up. So what palm species are attacked? Um, you can do some Google research. There's quite a list. Coconuts, African oil palms, sago palms. Obviously the Canary Island date palm is highly preferred in San Diego County. There are records of date palms, Phoenix dactylifera being killed, and fan palms. In fact, the first recorded host of this weevil in the Baja Peninsula were the Mexican fan palms, Washingtonia robusta species. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, thanks to help from uh, Megan Shaw and Greg Johansson with San Diego Parks and Rec, there has been a really large natural field experiment going on in Balboa Park, which has a, has a very rich and diverse uh, planting of, of a variety of different palm species, some of which the palm weevil has not encountered before, but it's finding them suitable as, as hosts. So one of the first reports that came in was here of the uh, Guadalupe palms, uh, Brahea edulis, which were taken out by South American palm weevil. Then subsequent to that, uh, Megan and Greg recorded some other palm species that were taken out, the Senegal palm, Phoenix reclinata shown here, and these Chile Chilean wine palms, Jubea chilensis, have also been killed at Balboa Park. Interestingly, I was talking to Ricardo Agu uh, Eglia, um, it was probably, when was it, maybe last week or so, about the Chilean wine palms, and he mentioned that they had been taking um, some of these palms out as well, and he sent some very nice photos. Here's one in, in um, somebody's backyard. They got a call, the palm was looking sick. They looked at the fronds, you can see the tunnels there where the weevil larvae have gone in. You can see the pupil uh, cocoons wedged into these uh, 
chambers that they have drilled into the bottoms of these fronds. Then when they looked in the top part of the palm that had been pretty much hollowed out, you were able to pull out the South American palm weevil cocoons and they found some adults in there as well. So this was really good evidence that Chilean wine palms are probably vulnerable to attack by South American palm weevil. The mortality of these palm, these new palm species, is nowhere near as high as what we are seeing in the environment when compared to uh, Canary Islands date palms. Those Canary palms are by far the preferred host, at least at this stage in San Diego County, probably because there's there are just so many of them available and it's a highly preferred palm species for the weevil to attack. So the last one that was being taken out and um, that Megan reported was this palm here, Sable Bermudana. Uh, this was apparently a little bit tricky to identify and we have to thank Don Hodel for helping with the identification of this palm. So now we have four of these new palm species, Brahea, Phoenix reclinata, the Chilean wine palm and the sable palm that's uh, endemic to Bermuda. So one question I get asked a lot is that these weevils are big and can they fly? And the answer is yes, they're very strong flyers. And we figured this out in the laboratory by hooking them up to these insect merry-go-rounds. It's called a flight mill. So each revolution that the insect does is about three feet or a meter. And the data is it's spinning around is transmitted on these cables to the laptop computer so we can record how far male and female weevils fly. We can look at the different effects of say, whether they're fed or starved, if they're mated or not mated, uh, whether they're um, old or young weevils. And we can collect those data on those different variables to see whether or not it affects the flight capacities of these weevils. This is a seemingly simple question to ask. You know, how far can insects fly? How far can the weevil fly? We get asked this a lot as entomologists, but it's incredibly difficult to accurately answer that question. Because if you were to go out to the field, mark some weevils and throw them up in the air and watch them fly away, you'd lose them in a few minutes. So we have to use these highly artificial flight mills to at least get an idea of what uh, the flight capacities of these weevils is like. Well, the weevils are extremely strong flies. You can see in this graph here, the total distance flown shown on the x-axis, and then here on the y-axis are the percentage of weevils that fall into these different distance bins. So on average, they can fly about 25 miles in a 24 hour period. We had some weevils that were capable of flying about 62 miles in a 24 hour period. And incredibly, we had one female weevil that flew an astonishing 93 miles in a one 24 hour period. But what we don't know is whether or not they're capable of doing this in nature. In the lab, they can do this. If the temperatures are perfect for them. There's no wind resistance to slow them down. The humidity is great. But whether or not they do this in nature, we don't know. However, what I think these data are telling us that if these weevils choose to fly long distances, they are capable of doing it. So if they're in an urban area, they come up against some chaparral, and maybe it's five or six miles across that patch of chaparral to the next uh, urban site that has palm trees in it, they should be able to fly over those wilderness areas and get into somebody's backyard palms. Another way they could be moved uh, long distances inadvertently is through the transportation of live palm trees that are coming out of San Diego. And at this time, as far as I'm aware, there are no quarantine restrictions on moving live palms out of infested areas of San Diego County. So, you know, this truck maybe could drive all the way up to San Luis Obispo and then plant these palms and there's weevils hiding in them. We, we don't know and there's no restrictions on those movements. So where is the weevil right now <clears throat> in San Diego County? Well, the most um, northern record that we currently have is around the San Marcos Escondido area. And that's a distance of about 35 miles from the Sweetwater Reserve down here in Bonita, where we have been doing a lot of our trapping work. So this suggests that the weevil is just moving naturally at about northwards, about a rate of six miles per year, which is much, much slower than what those flight mill studies suggest it's capable of doing. However, this may be because there's just so much food available for it. It kills one palm tree and only has to fly maybe 100 feet to the next palm tree to find something to eat. So the rest of the story, we're going to go down here into Bonita and we're going to have a look at what's going on in the Sweetwater Reserve. This is the Sweetwater Reserve. It's a riparian area. There's a stream that flows through here. It's seasonal. Um, the drainage is from the uh, Sweetwater Reservoir, which is uh, about five or eight miles further up this, this valley. 
But within this riparian zone are hundreds and hundreds of naturalized Canary Island date palms. And this has been a great area for us to do our survey work on the South American palm weevil. If you take a close up shot here of the Google Earth, you can see the Canary Island date palms here. They look like sea anemones reaching above the mainly willows trees. And here you can actually see one Canary Island date palm that has been killed off by the South American palm weevil. It's got that brown mushroom or brown umbrella appearance now. So in the Sweetwater Reserve, I have 10 traps every month. They are checked, loaded up with the agrochin pheromone, which is commercially available. And to enhance the attractiveness of that pheromone, we have this um, ventilated container. And in this container, we have water, dates, and baker's yeast, and that ferments. And then those fermentation volatiles waft out of the bucket. And in combination with the pheromone, they're highly attractive to the weevils. The weevils are attracted to the bucket. They walk up the burlap, drop into the hole, and then they drown in the antifreeze here. So every month I go out, count the number of male and female weevils, clear the traps and reset them. So the data that you show here, see here, these bars indicate the total number of weevils caught in those 10 traps each month from July 2016 right up to January 2021. We're going to be running this experiment through January 2022. I think there's something, there's a couple of things here that I would like you to take home from this graph. First off, we catch weevils all year round, even over the winter, they're still flying. However, during the winter periods, you can see here that the numbers of weevils that we are catching tend to be lower than what we are catching over the spring and through midsummer. The other thing that I think is instructive here is that when we first started this experiment, we were catching relatively low numbers of weevils. Looks like you're, you might be freezing a little bit. Let's see. I can hear you guys. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, it's getting a little bit better, but yes, you're you're like cutting in and out a little bit. Yeah, it looks like he's frozen. All right, a little bit of technical difficulty here. Mark, can you still hear us? Maybe try um, reloading. Okay. Let me do that. Yeah, it seems like his, his internet's having challenges. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we'll just give him a minute here. We've got some time. So I guess while we're, we're waiting, I'll just chime in and I'll say, um, so I'm Megan Shaw, I'm the horticulturist and park arborist here in Balboa Park and um, we have been having quite a lot of challenges with our palms. We have a collection of palm trees from all over the world here so it's quite an interesting experiment that's happening naturally here just to see which trees this palm weevil is selecting from our, our, good, our collection of uh, exotic palms from all over. Um, we have actually lost quite a lot of the um, Brahea edulis, almost as many as Canary Island day palms.
they seem to be going rapidly and very fast. So that seems to be another preferred species. Um, and then we've had two to three confirmed cases on the Phoenix Reclinata and multiple, um, probably four to five uh, of the Chilean wine palms. Um, and then just one sable, sable bromuniata um, that we lost so far, but we only have maybe like three of those total in our whole collection. So, so it's challenging. We're losing palms pretty much every day. Um, and we're working with some of our nonprofits like the Friends of Alba Park. And uh, we got a small grant for SD, uh, SDG and Environmental Champions Grant to help us mitigate um, the issues we're seeing in Babel Park. Well, we have a schedule of, I think, um, so far we've lost around 100 trees, 80 to 100 trees due to the palm weevil. And we have a long list of trees that are scheduled for removal, which they should, uh, removals are slowly being done by the city forestry crew and uh, West Coast Arborist will shortly be removing some of our larger ones for us. Um, so the city is working on a, um, a management plan in some sense, I guess, the management of removing dead palms, basically. We can't do a whole lot of treatment of palms, just um, certain very high priority palms we can treat because they have to be treated with the pesticide so often. Um, it's expensive and we just don't have the budget to be treating all the trees in our park system um, or our city. So um, that's pretty much the information I've got on what we're yeah, doing if, here. If I could chime in as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, We've been helping with the city of San Diego for quite a while now. I know uh, Brian Widener's on the call here today, but it's definitely a significant problem. Uh, South Bay specifically, I'd, to me, it feels like one out of every three uh, Canary Island day palms specifically south of the eight freeway is pretty much already dead, if not infested. And uh, the unfortunate thing is it, it, the heads can become destabilized, you know, as this weevil you know, choose through that tissue, it basically creates a, a little bit of a bowl. You know, you get the, the, the interior chewed out and essentially all the frond weight that's still intact, uh, typically dead by that point, it kind of flat tops, but that can become destable or unstable. And uh, if there's targets below, obviously that's a big concern. So it's, it's a big deal. And unfortunately there's, um, to my knowledge, no uh, real big interest from a federal standpoint or a state standpoint to eradicate it. Um, you know, it, it really hasn't been, I think once it attacks an agricultural crop, and I noticed that was one of the questions asked, is uh, has it attacked the um, dactylifera variety, the, the date palm variety? And, and I, Mark had listed one in his presentation, said it looked like it did, it did happen, but I, I, that'd be the first I've heard of that. But I do think once you target an agricultural crop in California, that's when things might get triggered as far as reaction and, and uh, maybe some funding to, to help uh, eradicate it. But I think the understanding is that it was a, um, it naturally migrated, which is different than a unnatural pest invasion. It looks like we're getting Mark back on here. Mark, All right, Mark, we've got, your, we've got your screen up. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I'm back. Yes, and you're absolutely right. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. great. All right, let's let's move on. Let's move okay. on before I fall apart again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so around the Sweetwater Reserve, in addition to doing that trapping, we've also been monitoring palms in the urban landscape, and we have 490. Whoa. And we have 491 of these palms in the urban landscape. And they're spread out in a north south west surveys back in August of 2016. And the initial complement of palms had no obvious damage to them. By the time uh, we got up to August 2020, you can see we're now up to about 45% of those palms that we were monitoring have now been killed by the weevil. 
and we'll be continuing these surveys on into uh, 2022 and that'll complement the trapping work that we're doing at the Sweetwater Reserve. So it's not surprising, there's just this very rapid uphill linear looking trend here in palm mortality over time, which has been caused by the South American palm weevil. So we had funding from the California Department of Food and Ag. Uh, as Mike was saying, there's gonna be a lot of concern once this weevil gets into the date gardens of the Coachella Valley, assuming that it is um, able to attack and kill uh, edible date palms, Phoenix dactylifera. And the literature does record the edible date palm as being a host. So there are two different types of traps that are available for monitoring the weevils. We are using the bucket trap out in the, in the Sweetwater Reserve. And this has been the standard trap for monitoring many different types of species of damaging palm weevils, including the red palm weevil that you may have heard of. Where a different trap has now been developed for monitoring palm weevils, and this is the Pacusan trap. It's a conical trap that sits on the ground. Bucket traps are suspended, can either be suspended in a tree or also placed on the ground. Both traps are loaded with fermenting bait that I described earlier and the aggregation pheromone. But with the bucket trap with these holes, uh, we did some very interesting work where we put video cameras around these traps to see how the weevils reacted to them. And what we noticed was that the, with the bucket traps, the weevils would readily come to them. They'd walk in and out of the bucket, in and out of these holes, and then about 66% of them or so would fly away and they would never get, get trapped. So even though we're catching good numbers of weevils in the buckets, the vast majority of them come to the buckets, walk in and out, don't fall into the antifreeze and drown, and then about 66% of them fly away. However, with the Pacusan trap with the video cameras, what it showed is the weevils land on the ground near the trap, they walk up it, and they drop into the trap. And this whole process takes just a few minutes. And inside the Pacusan trap, it is shaped like an inverted funnel. So once the weevils fall in, they can't walk back up to the top of the trap to get out. So the trapping efficiency of this uh, Pacusan trap is over 90%, and it's a far superior trapping design in comparison to the bucket trap. So how much better? Well, the studies that we did indicated that the Pacusan trap would catch and retain six times more weevils than the standard bucket trap that's been traditionally used for monitoring palm weevils. Both traps operated very effectively with a liquid bait solution that was a combination of water, dates, and I add to this a packet of baker's yeast to speed up the fermentation process. We also tested two different species of yeast, one that's used for making wines and one that's used for making beer and by far the superior yeast that I, I guess the fermentation volatiles must be different depending on the species of yeast that you use but the baker's yeast resulted in, in a much greater catch of these weevils. Now the other good thing about the baker's yeast is that it's cheap and it's readily available from the um, supermarket. So some caveats for using traps. Trap placement. Don't hang the traps near palm trees. They may attract weevils that will miss the trap and they could end up attacking the palms. Why? Well, because especially with the bucket trap, it's not 100% efficient at capturing weevils. The Pacusan trap is much better. However, as the weevils are coming to the Pacusan, should they see the palm tree or get attracted to the palm tree, they may end up attacking that rather than going into the trap. So don't put the traps close to the palms that you are trying to protect from weevil attack. As I mentioned, a bucket trap catches about 30% of the weevils attracted to it. The Pacusan trap catches probably in excess of 90% of the weevils that come to it. The other thing that is important with trap placement is sun exposure. If the traps are placed in areas that receive full sun or they're going to be hit by the midday sun, that exposure results in low weevil captures. If the traps are in partial or full shade, weevil captures are, uh, tend to go, go up. And we think the reason for this is that when the sun is hitting the trap, it gets so hot inside, some temperature probes that we put in there indicate that the temperatures can reach over 140 degrees. This may be breaking down the pheromone or stopping the um, fermentation processes that make the bait attractive. So if you can put your trap in partial or full shade, that is much better than putting traps out in areas where they're going to be hit by full sun all day, or they have a, a long exposure period during middle to late afternoon when the sun is at its strongest. So take home traps, take home messages for using the traps. 
Use the commercially available Pacusin trap. You can buy it from Iskatec and Riverside. It's superior to the bucket trap. And um, it just sits on the ground. And we have tested this by putting bucket traps in trees and on the ground. And the bucket trap placement makes no difference in weevil trap captures. The Pacusin is superior to the bucket trap. Bait type. Uh, the Pacusin and the Lua only will work quite well. This may be good for detection if you don't have a lot of time to get out there and replace the bait. However, if you put out the Pacusin, the Lua and that fermenting bait, especially using dates, water and baker's yeast, it increases trap captures significantly and maybe this could be a way to control these weevils through a mass trapping program in areas that you're concerned about uh, protecting. Trap placement. Don't put the traps on palm trees. One of the things we've been discussing with areas uh, with big corporations, say like Disneyland or maybe the San Diego Zoo, is don't have the traps inside your um, facility if you're concerned about the palm trees in there. You might be drawing weevils in. Instead, go outside of your facility and maybe put them within a half a mile radius around the area of concern. If you are trapping weevils within that area of uh, in that buffer zone around the area that you're trying to protect, I think that's a very good indication that there are weevils in the general vicinity of the area of concern and that they may even be infiltrating the area that you're trying to protect. There's no special habitat required for deploying these traps. We've had them sitting on the ground in a pile of sand and rocks, no palm trees around, and the weevils will still come to them. I think the most important thing is, is that the traps are put in the shade so they don't get cooked in the sun. So there is a biological control agent for this, for this weevil. It's a parasitic fly that's native to Brazil. Uh, the biology, behavior, and ecology of this fly is very poorly studied. We don't know if it can be mass reared, and it's certainly never been used in a biological control program targeting the invasive South American palm weevil. So this, this fly lays its eggs on infested palm trees, and it looks like that the fly eggs, once they hatch those larvae, crawl down into the palm, hunt out palm weevil larvae, and then probably attach themselves to the body of the palm weevil larva. Then once that larva starts spinning up the cocoon, and it's within the cocoon, these fly maggots finish their development, and they basically consume the host. And you can see that on average, one weevil larva produces about 10 flies. And parasitism, depending on the time of year in Brazil, can be as low as 30% over the cooler periods, reaching a maximum of 70% during the summer periods. And that averages out to about 50% year-round year round. This fly will attack other species of weevils that infest palm. But fortunately for us in California, we don't have other native species that inhabit that palm environment. Potential use for, in California. Well, I managed to get a grunt from the USDA to go to Brazil to look for this fly and then just conduct some very simple biology studies. Basically, if we cannot get this fly to mate and lay eggs in a box, simply a cage, there is no way we can work with this fly in the quarantine facility. Some of these parasitic flies have very bizarre um, reproductive behaviors. They need to fly around in the sun, land on flowers, do their courtship behaviors outside and all this sort of thing. And if that's the case, and we can't replicate that within a cage in the quarantine facility, we won't be able to rear this fly to do the studies that we need to do or mass rear it for release into California. So the Brazil project was shut down because of the COVID crisis. Uh, the USDA has extended funding for this through 2021. It seems unlikely we will be able to go to Brazil this year because COVID seems to be uh, accelerating and getting more out of control in Brazil right now rather than getting better. So this may be something that we'll need to revisit again in the future after COVID's died down and we'll see if we can get the funding to go and look for this fly. Uh, so please, uh, if you see palms that in the San Diego area, or especially outside of San Diego County now, uh, that look like they have been killed by the South American palm weevil, please visit our palm weevil website, and you can find the link there to upload uh, information on infested palms. You can put in photographs, street address, the GPS coordinates. We pull down those data and we're loading them into a Google Earth map so we can uh, plot the spread of this pest throughout San Diego County. Um, this QR code 
will take you straight to the website. So if you would like to uh, scan that with your phones, I'll leave it up for a couple of seconds. Uh, it'll take you right to the website so you don't have to bother writing down any um, web addresses. And yes, if you can help with uh, reporting of these palms, that would be really, really great. We can use all the help we can get from community scientists to track the spread of this pest through Southern California. So some acknowledgements, uh, we've had funding from uh, the USDA, California Specialty Crops, the California Date uh, Commission. I'd like to thank West Coast Arborists, especially Mike Pallett. He's been uh, really great at helping us find these infested palms. Uh, the weevil larvae uh, and adults that we got for those flight mill studies, we basically got those from palm trees that West Coast Arborists were cutting down and we were pulling the uh, weevils out of them. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be really happy to answer those for you. Yes, we are going to have a Q&A session. I would like to bring in um, Don Hodel. Hodel? Hodel. Hodel. Okay. I always yep. confuse your last names. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Hodel and Don's the Hodel. The Hodel and the Hodel. And Yes. And then also Eric Cast, our park arborist, um, who can speak about what's going on here in San Diego. Um, first, I'd like to just ask a question for you, Don. Um, I know you talked a little bit about a new species, the banana moth. Is banana that correct? Moth. Banana yes. moth. Yes. Do they, does the South American palm weevil and the banana moth have similar symptoms? Well, in, in a way they, yeah, in a, in a way they, they, they do, they, they both affect primarily the new growth and um, roughly they, they do, yeah, yeah. And you get, see the flattening kind of at the top. Yeah, yeah, and you see the, the new, the new growth sometimes is, is damaged and, um, deformed with the banana moth it, it, with the with the palm weevil I, I'm, I think you see distinctive parts of the leaf being chewed out and um, you don't see that so much with banana moth banana moth it, it looks deformed scrunched up S sometimes it might look like it's truncated but it's a little bit different actually I think there's a greater chance of, of rodent damage being mistaken for palm weevil uh, damage. Squirrels and rats chewing off the leaves. Thank you. Um, okay, one question. When, once the weevil is present at a site, what can we do to protect non-infected specimen? What are their chances for survival? Um, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, is that question for me, Megan? Yeah, yeah. Right, so um, I didn't, um, well, you know what? Uh, can I show a couple of slides on that? Please, I didn't show them please. in this presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, can you guys see this one? Yes. Okay, just come down here. So uh, palm recovery is possible, even at late stages of attack. Um, when we were doing the surveys around Sweetwater Reserve, this tree that I've photographed here in August of 2018, I looked at that in February 2018. It was basically just a ring of fronds around the top of the trunk. And I said, ah, oh, that's dead. We came back in August 2018, six months later, to confirm that. These little spriglets of growth are coming up out of the top. It's like, holy moly, it's, it's recovered. So I talked to the homeowner, and they, they treated this palm tree with systemic insecticides. So then we came back every six months to check to see what was going on. February 2019, you can see that the carrot top now is really starting to take off. August 2019, it was looking really great. You would 
wouldn't have known that it had been attacked by South American palm weevil. And then 2020, there was, you'd have zero you know, inclination that this palm had almost died. But now the homeowner is going to have to be treating this palm every six to eight months to prevent those attacks from happening again. I was photographing this tree, which is right across the street from the Sweetwater Reserve, and the homeowners came over and said, you know, why are you photographing our dead palm tree? And I said, well, it's, it's not dead, it's coming back to life. And they didn't believe me because they hadn't seen this spriglet of growth from their backyard. You could only see it on the side of the fence that I was standing on, and they had done nothing to treat this tree. So incredibly, there must have been a small amount of palm material small amount of meristematic tissue that was still alive in the top of this basically dead palm tree that was coming back to life. So palms may be in very rare circumstances, they may be able to recover on their own if there's a little bit of meristematic tissue left. We're going to be following the fate of this palm tree when we do our surveys. It'll be interesting to see if this palm manages to really come back to life or whether the weevils are going to hit this uh, new material again and basically kill it off. So no insecticides apply to this palm. I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions on the specifics uh, insecticides that you recommend using. Oh, sorry, I, I missed that. that uh, systemic uh, insecticides. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. Yeah, just the specific types of insecticides that might be helpful. Yeah, so um, I've talked to Ricardo Aguilar about this quite a bit, and some of the insecticide work that we're doing with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific, the data that are coming in, that we're still at the early stages. Now, I've, you know, I've learned a lesson from jumping the gun on these insecticide trials in the past by saying, oh, you know, we've got something that's working really great, and then it sort of falls over towards, <laughs> towards the end of the trials. So I'm not going to be throwing out any names of products or stuff, but until I'm absolutely sure I've got it right this time before I have to do the embarrassing mere culpa at the next meeting to say oh, I got that wrong again. Um, so yeah, it looks like systemics work fairly well. Uh, you can apply them as soil drenches, uh, even foliar drench, uh, crown drenches work. And there's some suggestion that um, trunk injections may work too. And I know Don's not uh, favorable on that because the palms can't repair themselves after the trunk injections have been made. So I'm trying to dissuade people from doing that. However, there is there are times when the ground may be so compacted under the palm trees that it's very difficult to pressure inject or just do a, a drench directly onto the soil because the, the, the materials just run off. So in those instances, you know, trunk injections may be warranted or if you can get up into the crown and actually do a crown drench, that may work too. I think Ricardo's crew are actually trying to do crown sprays now. Um, and he's suggesting that some of their anecdotal evidence suggests that crown sprays with contact insecticides may work fairly well too. Assuming coverage is good enough and enough material can dribble down into the, um, into the crown, especially into those nooks and crannies where those weevil larvae are going to be feeding. Excellent. Um, next question, uh, do we think that the Camp Pendleton military base serves as a natural barrier for the South American palm weevil between San Diego and Orange County? Right, um, possibly, but then again, maybe not. <laughs> um, our flight mill data suggests that if the weevils come up against a big natural area devoid of palm trees, say like Camp Camp Pendleton or other big areas of Chaparral. If it's only 20 or 30 miles across that, and especially if they have a tailwind coming off, say, the coast, they may be able to fly right over those areas. That's what the flight mill data suggests. And I tried to point out in the presentation that these are highly artificial data. Whether or not the weevils do this in real life and under natural conditions, we, we simply don't know. We can't monitor weevil flight over such vast distances in, in nature. So they may, those areas may act as natural barriers or it's quite possible that the weevils, if they feel like they've got nothing to lose, they will just fly right over those areas and get into the urban zones on the other side. Right. They, they have the capacity to do that should they elect to do so. I also believe that 
I've seen a couple Canary Island date palms along the coast throughout Camp Pendleton. So I feel like they would have enough uh, yeah. habitat to hitchhike up there. Oh, and then Brian exactly. Widener also says that he's seen evidence of a dead um, weevil on a car. So there's definitely potential they could be hitchhiking <laughs> or a ride. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that happens more often than you think. You know, I've been in areas, just say, with glassy wing sharpshooter, for example. I've had them sit on the windscreen for miles going up the freeway. <laughs> they fall off when you slow down. So, yeah, palm weevils could certainly hitchhike rides. Absolutely no doubt about it. There have been areas when um, you know, I've coming back from doing the Sweetwater Reserve and I've been handling the pheromones and, that, and I've stopped for gas, you know, several miles away from the reserve. And I'm standing at the pump. And I, I'm being hit by weevils. I open up the trunk of the car, for example. I have to be careful that live ones aren't flying into the buckets when I'm <laughs> fooling around with, you know, packing stuff away. I've got to check everything to make sure I'm not accidentally transporting them back to Riverside. And if you have the pheromone on your hands, they will land on you or start buzzing you around the gas station. Great. All right. Well, that puts us right at 12.30. So we're right on schedule right now. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions, and thank you, Don and Mark, for your wonderful presentations and information. You're just a vast uh, well of knowledge, both <laughs> of you. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Mike, welcome. would you like to take over now? Yeah, sure. So yeah, just to echo what Megan says, thank you, guys. And um, yeah, really appreciate your time and your your uh, effort on this issue. It's It's not going anywhere for a long time, it looks like. And um, all these issues with pests. And I know the stats are, I think uh, I've heard Kabashima say every 40 days there's a new exotic pest introduced to uh, right. Southern California. So scary stuff. So with that, um, again, thank you. And we're going to take a break. We're actually there we go. All right. Welcome back. <laughs> Hopefully you all had a chance to get lunch. I had buffalo, what are, what are, what are we doing? Wings and things. I had hot wings, so I survived that. Um, so yeah, welcome back. Um, we're gonna resume our uh, meeting here. We have our, our business items. Hopefully you can all see the agenda here. And I'm hoping to wrap this up in about 25 minutes, get us, get us uh, completed by 1.30. I'm sure we all have other things to go do. So. Um, we just got done with our executive committee meeting uh, prior to this, and a uh, lot of exciting things happening with that group. We uh, discussed the uh, next meeting topic uh, for the June 2nd meeting. Still a little bit of debate on that, but might be talking about tree risk and how to address the public in that regard. I think that's an ongoing challenge, a lot of political things happening with tree removals and the controversies associated with them. So maybe some tools for arborists on how to uh, better articulate the rational reasons why trees have to come out. So I think that's the direction we're heading. That'll be June 2nd. Um, we also discussed the uh, remaining budget um, for the U.S. Forest Service funds that we get. We get about $2,000 and I think we had about $1,500 left. So we're looking at getting a, a, an easy up because we're hopeful that public events start to happen again here in the near future. Um, and we're also uh, dedicating some funds to the Kate Sessions initiative that, um, that Anne's been heading up. So that's, that's another thing as well. So yeah, uh, a lot of cool stuff and we got a good core group of executive committee members. I thank you, you know who you are and anybody else who wants to be on that, just go ahead and text that in the text box and we'll include you in the executive committee. So um, with that, I'd like to ask Lynette from Cal Fire to uh, hop on. I know uh, she mentioned to me she's, she's got some stuff to deal with, so, and then I'll, I'll come back. So Lynette, are you there? Let me see. You're muted, Lynette. I still mute. Oh, you want to unmute? Yeah, unmute her. I'm getting there. There you go. Yeah, when you went to screen sharing, it's different. Let me alter my video on real quick. There we go. Okay. It goes to, there's like six different screens that I see. Hi guys. You see me? There you go. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, just quick update for Cal Fire grants, and uh, I may have covered kind of the same message back a couple months ago at the last meeting. Um, and it still stands if I did, but uh, for any of you that didn't hear that update or if I didn't give it, um, because it's been slightly changing over time. Uh, but we will be releasing our grant program again this year. Um, it will likely be on this a similar timeline. We have to wait until the governor's budget is signed. Um, right now, there are definitely funds um, in the docket and there will be probably like two sets of funds. So here, here's how it goes. Um, we may release our grant program, uh, like advertise it and collect applications or, or uh, concept proposals before the end of this fiscal year. So that's one thing that's way different than years in the past. So be on the lookout over the next couple of months for us to advertise. Um, and I will try and advertise this widely. If you're connected to Regional Urban Forest Council, I usually, you know, let Mike know or a California Urban Forest Council is really good about getting the word out. But before the end of this fiscal year, so before June 30th, um, we are likely to advertise. Um, and just a little bit behind that. So we're going to, we're likely to receive some funding prior to the end of the fiscal year that can fund the grant program. We're not going to announce how much funds we have because we anticipate receiving more funds after uh, this fiscal year ends, so next fiscal year. But what we'll do is we'll group both of these, um, these funding sources into one grant program. So we're only gonna advertise once and we'll be advertising for a longer period of time. So it's gonna come earlier this year, but as far as entering into agreements and making uh, project selections, that's still going to end up being about the same time frame. So we're looking at um, fall or so when we will be making um, selections or when we'll just say when the application period has ended. And by then we'll be able to advertise publicly how, how much funds everybody is competing for. Um, I can, what I can say is it's likely to be more than in the past. I'm not allowed to really say how much because I say how much and we don't receive as much we don't um we just don't want to falsely advertise that there's you know more funds than we're going to actually have available uh various funding sources i can't i can't comment on that but um it actually doesn't matter because to re regardless of the funding source we're going to choose to stick with uh one streamlined guideline process for everybody so that's not confusing um, and so that we're collecting the same reporting and data for everybody, regardless of the funding source. Uh, just background to that, R depending on the funding source, we have certain um, data that we have to collect from the grantees and everything, but we have found that it's super useful to have all of it. Um, so it's gonna look really similar. If you guys are uh, familiar with our grant program, uh, it's gonna look really similar and same programs uh, likely to be advertised as before and available. And if you're not familiar with it, you can go ahead and get on a, um, the Cal Fire Urban Forestry page and just understand when you get on that web page, there's also a separate grants, um, Cal Fire Urban Forestry grants page. So take a look at that and what we're able to have uh, available up there, barring ADA accessibility. Um, majority of our content is there. There's, it seems a little stripped down right now because we're still dealing with accessibility issues, but you'll get the gist and we are um, doing our best to post uh, summaries and descriptions of past projects. That's a question we get a lot from everybody. So you should be able to see that stuff up there on our webpage. Um, so that's the, the latest and greatest with our grant program currently. Um, for any of you who are involved with or have knowledge of our current grant programs, we are looking around June, we're probably gonna be able to extend our current projects. And that means our, our grant projects that are probably most affected by COVID. So if they were in the 2018 to 2020-ish uh, grant cycles, we're probably gonna be able to give at least a year extension due to COVID uh, difficulties that everybody has experienced. So we're, we're waiting for that. We, we started mentioning this about a year, man, a little at less than a year ago. We just have to wait until we get to the end of the fiscal year to, to do this. So um, that's still coming. I still get that question a lot in the field. So that's why I bring it up. Um, but that's that's it for the update for, for us for now. Um, we, we changed the settings so that if anybody has any questions, you can unmute yourselves and ask 
So does anybody have any questions for Lynette? I'll go look at the chat. There's chat too, but we did uh, we did do a setting change on this fancy technology here that people could uh, ask you direct questions. Yeah, you just unmute yourselves if anybody has any. But um, so that that's pretty exciting, Lynette, that there is going to be a grants program. So there, you'll have a call for applications this fiscal year, which is interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Most likely. I mean, anything's possible, but we've we've known this for a couple of months now. Um, kind of shocked it hasn't happened yet, but just within the, it very likely could happen within the next month or so. So it's going to essentially give people a little bit of a longer period of time to put some, uh, some project ideas together. Awesome. Could you, could you give, give some people may not be familiar with your programs. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of grants you've uh, awarded in the past or what's, you know, what kind of categories are out there? Yeah, I'll stick to what's most relevant to now. So we'll have, um, we will have an urban wood one uh, that's become very popular, urban, um, urban wood reutilization type uh, uh, grant program that focuses on any kind of projects, uh, not just solely to utilize, but just to come up with uh, better practices for uh, the end of life cycle trees. So um, that's gonna be one of our programs. We have um, uh, our management uh, program. So it's geared towards municipalities and usually only local governments can apply for that program. Uh, but it's, it's for the formulation update uh, of a urban forest management plan or inventory. So, and it could be both. Um, there can be a plant, a tree planting component to that program as well. Uh, but again, I stress that that is really only available to local um, municipalities. Um, and then we have our, basically our, our shh, I'm on a meeting real quick, sorry. Um, and then we're, uh, we have our tree planting uh, program and we're toying around with the idea of changing the name of it, but um, most likely it's probably going to stay, stay the same as it was in the past. Um, but it's just geared towards uh, urban greening, uh, tree planting, and um, any of the activities surrounding around that. But if the majority of the budget for that program is to get trees in the ground, sequester carbon, um, that's our that's our third program. So just those three main categories. And again, if you get on our grants page, you can look and see uh, a short description and who the recipient was of those grants and uh, the amount that was awarded to those uh, for like the past two grant cycles or so. It just gives you a little bit, a little bit of an idea if you're unfamiliar with our grant programs. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Anybody, any questions for Lynette? Okay. All right. Thank you, Lynette. Appreciate the update. Okay. Very good. Thanks, guys. All right, um, Megan, I'd like to have you come on, if you don't mind, maybe give us an update on what's happening with the California Urban Forest Council. All right, everyone can hear me okay? Yep. Cool, so um, there's a couple cool things going on. They're, we're talking about co-sponsoring some new urban forest legislation in, Sa in Sacramento. Um, with Senator Ann Caballero's office. It's still in the early stages, so we are working hard to get them to revise the approach to be broader and more inclusive. Um, we're still just talking a lot about strategic planning. Um, we got, let's see, we've been talking about the bylaws, so that's not super interesting stuff for you guys. Um, Yeah, and then we're just still talking about being um, inclusive, trying to reach out and expand to different groups that we normally wouldn't be working with. We just had a um, racial justice training for everyone on the board. And so that's kind of been the focus for the last couple meetings that we've had. Okay. So we're still working on some things. I know there's some different programs um, that they've got going on. Um, out there to plant some trees and help some of the municipalities out. Yeah, I, I know I was on a call with uh, Nancy Hughes, who's the executive director of the California Urban Forest Council. She had set up with the American Forest Group and it was all about green jobs and how to, how we can get, you know, people attracted to doing the tree work that's needed to maintain all these urban forests. So that was an interesting call and it was quite a, quite a few, uh, 
highfalutin people that uh, hopefully can make some influence on uh, making a trickle down potential dollars for grant opportunities towards green job initiatives. So I think that's pretty exciting. So, uh, Anne, you want to say something? Yeah, locally, we've been um, working with that national program com called Community, um, called um, Career Pathways with Urban Core and with some of the folks on this call. And so whenever you think about whatever's happening at the state or local level or national level, know that there's interest here and some steps made. Um, obviously, the most important or the most critical one is to get a little bit of funding um, to do some of the things that can't be done as to regular, but there's already things going on with Urban Core and with local companies in this uh, career pathways that you're yeah, referring to. Urban Core, was on, Urban Core was on that call that I was on Great. as well. Awesome. Yeah, there was also um, a little bit of talk about getting the Urban Forest Councils like us, there's several others throughout California um, to do things in joint efforts. So maybe teaming up with another Urban Forest Council that's local to us, maybe something up in Orange County or LA. Um, and kind of working together on some things. So just kind of brain, we're just kind of brainstorming on getting involved, more involvement of all the councils. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Any questions for Megan? All right, awesome. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'd like to have uh, SDG and E. I know there's some folks here from SDG and E. I, I could call you out. I know Dan is Dan's my favorite. My, Dan's my boy there. I know Dan. Me and Dan. How long have I known you, Dan? I don't know. My son's uh, twenty something years old now. Hey, he he was born That's when how we I market, met huh? you, right? <laughs> yeah. So Dan, what's happened with San Diego Gas and Electric? Hey, thanks for having us, Michael. Uh, that was a really good uh, a summer webinar, and those guys are great. And um, I actually saw a new bug. It's that uh, gall wasp, and it decimated a big uh, blue gum, one of those little canyons in uh, Kensington, hmm. like overnight hmm. almost. So that might be a new bug we have to contend with. But, um, you know, as long as there's uh, the sun shining, trees growing, bugs chewing, and gravity pulling them trees down on our power lines, we're going to be out there working. COVID or not. So, um, but our big thing, you know, no fires, no fires, no fires. And uh, we've, we've done pretty well. Uh, we haven't had a uh, ignition in months. So knock on wood, uh, it's a really good thing. But this year we really, um, uh, the overall sustainability goal for San Diego Gas Electric is going to be uh, planting trees, giving back into the community. So uh, I think on this call, we got uh, Morgan Justice Black and Vince from DRG and some of the Air Foresters, we're going to be giving away trees left and right, right and left, private property now, as long as it's kind of, you know, in the open community or, or public space, I guess. Uh, we, we have a lofty goal of 10,000 trees uh, in wow. San Diego service territory. Um, 5,000 might be a good, if we hit that, it'd be happy, but, you know, 10,000 is pretty lofty, and I think I think the higher-ups kind of figuring that out, but anyways, we do want to uh, give out trees to the community and be part of the community, and there's going to be different ways through your area forester. I got one going with uh, City of Chula Vista. I think I think Wayne's on this call. We're doing uh, one of their city parks out by Olympic uh, Training Center, and then a bunch of trees into their open space. So we got at least a hundred right there. Um, so your area forester is going to be putting on, um, you know, Arbor Day events or just tree plantings. Uh, we got um, DRG. We we're enlisting uh, Davy Resource Group, Vince and his gang. I think we got a, a forester on uh, Nathan. You, Davia, I think you're on the line, and he's going to be running a lot of uh, tree events for us and kind of cataloging them, where they go, how much sequestration they're going to do, the value, all that good stuff. Awesome. And then we have Morgan Justice Black. She works in uh, community affairs, and I believe she's on the line. She might want to share some stuff, but really look for SDG uh, in, in, in totalitarian kind of, kind of giving back to the community with trees, which, you know, we've been trying to do this for a long time, so here it is in front of us. And I, I hope the it. San Diego Region Urban Forest Council, I hope we get a lot of trees in the ground with, uh, in partnership with actually all of you guys on this call. You know, it's opened up to almost anything. So contact your favorite. Mike's, I guess Mike's my favorite rep. But, oh, I uh, got you, buddy. You know, we, you we'll get some going. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Morgan, you want to we'll, see? We'll get going. Yeah, Morgan, you got something, man? No, I just wanted to share one uh, new program that we've developed. Um, we have developed uh, a program called our Healthy Communities Fruit Tree Program, and um, it's intended to support community gardens and school gardens by um, 
donating and installing um, fruit trees. It, it's a smaller scale program around 10 fruit trees per site. So um, it's not going to scale to get us to that 10,000 um, tree goal, but um, you know, we need a lot of arrows in our quiver to be able to um, meet, these, uh, meet these aspirational goals. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention is, you know, Dan, um, Dan mentioned that we have our sights on a number of Arbor Day projects. While COVID is certainly a challenge in being able to host large scale community events, um, our SDG&E vegetation management team has looked and identified unique ways to support tree planting this Arbor Day with many cities. So whether it's the um, drive through uh, tree giveaway that we're doing in Encinitas on Arbor Day, or the tree planting in Chula Vista that Dan mentioned at open spaces and parks. Um, we've got some trees going in um, at Grape Day Park in Escondido, as well as um, some efforts with schools um, in the kind of North Inland Corridor. So. Um, yeah, just keep us posted on opportunities for partnership and collaboration. We want to not only plant the trees, but make sure that they're set up for success for um, long and prosperous lives. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, I'm great, grateful to have you guys at the table. Grateful for your contribution towards uh, urban greening. And uh, yeah, we could definitely look forward to helping you in any way that we can. Just uh, just engage us. I think it's the best request I could put out there. We're, we're happy to help you. For sure. Actually, I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, just today, sdg &E launched our um, annual Environmental Champions Giving Initiative. Um, that's the grant program that Megan mentioned at the beginning um, that's supporting some of the partnership with Friends of Balboa Park and Parks and Rec. Um, this year's grant program does have a half a million dollars earmarked for tree planting and other urban greening projects. So oh. um, I will drop the link in the chat. If you know, um, this is exclusively eligible to nonprofit organizations. So cities are not eligible, um, but you know, a, a city nonprofit collaboration could certainly be considered. Awesome, that's great. That's great to be able to share something like that. Thank you so much. Very cool. All right, any questions for San Diego Gas and Electric folks? Okay, all right, well, good to see you guys. Thanks again. Mike, uh, we yes. have John Kabashima on the call and he's mentioning a couple new pests in the chat. Do we want to ask him to- On mute, buddy. Let's go, John, on mute. Where are you at? I'm retired. Yeah, <laughs> you don't sound retired. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's for Dan. Can you get a sample of those gall wasps over to the Ag Commissioner? We've had quite a few new gall wasps uh, identified, so we don't want to assume it's the blue gum gall wasp. It may be something new. It's very unusual for the gall wasp uh, okay. to foliate a tree. Yeah, Dan, do you, do you know if that was like officially diagnosed as that pest? No, that was that was Dan, oh, uh, me, uh, diagnosing, but uh, <laughs> okay. I, it looked like, um, you know, the tortoiseshell beetle, uh, uh, you know, on top of each other, whatnot. And you get a closer look and it, best described, looks like cancer. It's all coming from the inside out. It's really uh, gross. And I guess it's the little larvae, you know, in the stems. And it, yeah, it took down a big eucalyptus in uh, Kensington in a matter, they said December, they noticed it. And just the other day, we, we found it, you know, completely dead. Oh, uh, well, it, it looks dead. Um, but yeah, it's, I hope it's not, the, the blue gum, but it was on a blue gum. And I also well, looked around the neighborhood and some other blue gum seem to have it too. So it's not, hopefully it's not, but I sent, I put a link in the UCI uh, invasive website um, thing. And it looks a lot like uh, those photos, but it was very aggressive. It defoliated a whole tree and uh, it's a hazard now. So, that's yeah, so what we one, got. One, one, once again, I want to some... emphasize, I want to I emphasize that Something to take something down that quickly is probably a new exotic, and it takes a entomologist, uh, a, tax, a taxonomic yeah. entomologist, to distinguish between all of these organisms. I can't even identify some of these things when they first come in. I have to have have a, an expert at CDFA or the Ag Commissioner take a look at it. So, 
yeah, please, if you can, uh, sure. when you see things like that, submit them quickly. Because if it is something new, the, the sooner we find out about it, the better chance we have of doing something about it. Good point. Awesome. Thanks, okay. John. Uh, may I have your uh, contact information? Well, actually, just uh, I would say uh, give it to um, what is what what is the new entomologist's last name? Is it Cass? Um, yeah, I is believe it, so. Yes. Yeah. So so the San Diego County Agricultural Commissioner has a new entomologist. Yes. And you would want to give it to her because then she can send it up to Sacramento and have the taxonomist up there take a look at it. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think we're going to work the tree next week. That's, that's excellent. Because, you know, right. the, uh, on Thank these you. palm weevils, we'll it took two uh, years. Yeah, we're going to work that tree next week. Great. Awesome. All right. Thank you, John. Is there anything else? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll touch on something that um, Chrissy mentioned. We're, we are trying to look for a pheromone for the um, erythrina tip moth. But the problem is uh, it's not been officially found in county of Riverside. So for me to collect pupa, and I have to get like 30 pupa, which is very difficult. I have to triple, put it in triple containers uh, because we have a permit to transport it from uh, infested area to non-infested area. And so this, this year we renewed our permit and if I can get enough pupae and then take it over to UC Riverside, uh, Dr. Dr. Jocelyn Millar will try to figure out a pheromone. The importance of that is when Don mentioned uh, that it was a endophagous insect that feeds inside the, the plant. It's, it's very similar to something like the Nantucket pine tip moth that we had, we had a, a great difficulty con controlling the Nantucket pine tip moth because it did the same thing. It laid the eggs on the outside, larvae went inside and we couldn't get anything to it. So the trick with these endophagous in insects is to get a pheromone so you can find out when the moths are laying eggs and then treat for the eggs because that's the only life stage. Uh, the eggs and then the emerging larvae are the only life stages that are easily controlled. So, you know, this is also a tropical pest. So I don't know if it's ever going to really be a problem in Riverside because I think humidity more than temperature might be the, the limiting factor here. But I'm working on it. It's a real pain in the butt. Believe me, this is not my favorite type of thing to do. But uh, if we can especially if somebody has a large infestation of this, where I might actually be able to go out there and collect a lot of the, the uh, pupa or pre-pupa, that would make my life easier. And then if anybody finds it in Riverside County and we can get it, um, get, it, get it to a point where I don't need a permit to take it to work with it in Riverside County, we might actually be able to raise erythrina in a greenhouse at, in Riverside, and that would really make it easy for us. But right now we can't because it's a permitted pest. Um, so if you hear about it in Riverside, let me know. I'll go and verify and get it identified and then, then life will be much simpler for me because well, I'm doing this as a retired guy kind of screwing around. Hey Mike, you're muted. I said, we'll work on uh, simplifying your life, buddy. No problem. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to another meeting. Uh, okay. The retired guy Zoom meetings are are have been like the worst thing that come into my life. There's a lot of them. I'm with you. In fact, I got one at 1:30. I was just telling Liz we got to get off this one and jump onto that one. But uh, I did want to give Ann an opportunity. Ann, you want to give an update on anything, or are you uh, are you good? Yeah. You want to um not share your screen can we do that yeah I can start. yes all right real briefly the um regional urban Co forest council is um sponsoring a new more grassroots movement on tree planting called kate sessions commitment and we're focused on healthy trees for healthy neighborhoods and we've got uh five gallon trees that were reserved at two wholesale nurseries that are sold at village at um Walter Anderson Nursery downtown in Old Town, 
Um, we actually have quite a few left. Um, somehow people aren't buying trees this year. Um, um, Morgan and I had a conversation earlier this week and she and I both have an interest in having a conversation um, maybe with this invitation list about saying, what do we collectively know about why trees aren't being sold? Or we actually have some donation money that we're trying to encourage communities in underserved neighborhoods to, um, to plant and interface. So we're working that one hard. We um, are growing some trees from seed with support from Urban Forest Council at a place called Bancroft Center with Robin uh, Rive and some interfaith people. And the third piece is we're actually going to um, have some yard signs made so you could put them in front of your trees to be proud of um, healthy trees for healthy neighborhoods. And those will basically be distributed with donations so we don't have to deal with the sales. So we'll, um, we'll keep working, but it's very um, community based. It has arborists as well as others. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Ann. And then just for the quick, again, trying to be done by 1.30 or quick update, Tree San Diego. I, uh, I'm on the, uh, the board of directors for Tree San Diego, so my, my update's a little, little removed. I don't necessarily deal in the day-to-day -day operations of everything that we're doing over there, but um, we do have a, um, we're a recipient of some awesome grants. One of them is a CAL FIRE grant. We're actually planting trees in neighborhoods. Uh, working on that currently and uh, yeah definitely having our challenges and finding homes for these trees but working through it got some good partners and um, yeah we'll probably have more to report on that here shortly and there's a few other grants that I know we recently received and uh, the new board chair is Scott Paul from Taylor Guitars if you haven't met him he's a great dude and uh, he's basically going to be uh, at least the, uh, the chairman of the board for his term so he's new to that. Um, other than that, I think that's going to summarize at least uh, today's meeting again to keep us on time here. I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we will shoot for uh, another meeting June 2nd. Uh, be on the alert for that. It'll be virtual just like this. And uh, we look forward to having uh, more education and interactions with all of you. And just thank you for what you do for the urban trees of all of California, because some of you are not just San Diego. So thank you again. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting adjourned here and uh, have a wonderful day. So thank you.